In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Today, uh, in our readings, we have um, the epistle. is actually St. Paul's landmark teaching on Christian stewardship, and we'll touch on that briefly. Um, but the gospel is a wonderful gospel story today. And um, in fact, uh, Courier Janet tells me this is her favorite story when she was a little girl, and her mother used to come up at night just before she went to sleep and say, what story would you like tonight, darling? And she'd say, I want the story of a little girl who was healed by Jesus. And she asked for it night after night after night. It's a wonderful story of uh, the, uh, the power of uh, God working through Jesus. Uh, in fact, in this, in this particular chapter of uh, um, Luke's Gospel, he calms a storm, he casts a demon out of a person, and then he, uh, he heals the woman with the flow of blood, and then he raises this young girl from the dead. And then in chapter 9, we find that uh, Herod the Tetrarch is asking the question, who is this man? And that's the question we all have to ask ourselves. Who is this man? Is he just a man? Is he just a teacher? Did he just turn up 2,000 years ago and die, and that was it? Who is this man? And uh, the conclusion we've come to, of course, is that he is God incarnate, the second person of the Holy Trinity. God uh, come amongst us in this world. And we're, we're working towards, very shortly, we'll be having the, um, the preparation for the nativity when we remember his coming, his first coming into the world. So um, St. Luke's, St. Luke's gospel is really a... Uh, where he, he demonstrates the dynamic Jesus uh, where he's, it's, he's the action man. And uh, he, he goes through the, the Gospels sort of doing all these amazing things. Uh, and this, this raising of the dead of the young girl is one of three raisings of the dead that Jesus did while he was on earth. Uh, Lazarus, this young girl, and the young boy who died at, the, at Nain, the widow of Nain's son. So that is the question we need to ask. Who is this man? Who is he? And if he's God, then that changes everything in our lives. Changes the direction of our lives and uh, how we spend our time, our money, everything. But today I want to look at three, three quick topics. I've got the church fathers, the church prayers, and church encouragement. Three quick things. Uh, and first of all, the church fathers. I, went, I wanted to see what the church fathers say about um, this story of... Um, the healing of the woman um, with a flow of blood. And uh, I found that St. Andrew's, uh, uh, Saint, not St. Saint Andrew's, St. Ambrose, sorry, um, sees this woman who suffered for 12 years and was healed as a figure of the church. Um, and he asked this question, could it be uh, because it, because it, could it be because it's written, you shall walk after the Lord your God and fear him, and fear him and keep his commandments and obey his voice. You shall hold fast to him. That's a quote from Deuteronomy. And um, he asked this, what is the meaning of the ruler's daughters dying at the age of 12 and the woman having suffered an issue of blood for 12 years? So both stories have that in Luke, it's, not, it's in Matthew, but it's not in Mark. Both, both women have, uh, have this 12 years there. And, and he asked, is that significant? And he looked at it this way. He said, is it not uh, to make us understand that while the synagogue was full of vigor, because Jairus was the, uh, the chief, he was the head of the, the synagogue. So the synagogue was in full vigor at this stage. The church was suffering. And we have to note, we have to note that St. Ambrose, at the time that he was living, the, uh, almost, the church was almost totally Gentile. And the Gentiles, before their evangelization, were only the potential church. So the, the failure of the Jews becomes the strength of the Gentiles. For through their fall, salvation has come to the Gentiles, St. Paul says in Romans 11, verse 11. Um, so as one came to an end, then the other began. Um, for blindness, in part, has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles has come. 
The synagogue is older than the church, not in point of time, but insofar as salvation is concerned. While the Jews believed, the Gentiles did not believe and languished, captive to many illnesses of soul and body without healing medicine. They heard that the Jewish people were sick and they remained awake, awaiting the remedy that would save it. They, the Gentiles recognized that the time had come for the physician from heaven to come. They arose to meet him. They saw that he was pressed by a multitude. Those who press do not believe. So he's surrounded by Jews, I suppose, who's saying here, rather than those who do touch. So the Gentile woman came from behind, touched him, touched his, his garment, and she received power for healing. For the one who looks while, without perceiving sees nothing, and the one, nor does the one who hears who does not understand what he hears, nor does he touch who does not touch with faith. So those are the thoughts of um, St. Ambrose. And the thought that came to me was, um, at that stage, he's, he's saying the Gentile church has replaced the Jewish church, and she was the first one to kind of get the power of God to heal her there. And um, I was thinking, in Australia, I'm sorry about this, um, but I was thinking uh, all the ethnic churches speaking foreign languages and so on, here's our little church, we're kind of hanging on to the garments of Jesus and hoping for the power of God to come into us to enable the English-speaking parishes and churches around Australia to take hold and grow and multiply and reach the people of Australia because they need it, just like the Gentiles need it, needed it while the Jews were holding it to themselves. But the Australian English-speaking people need this orthodox tradition and teaching as well. So I just... That was an encouragement to me when I read that, when I read uh, St. Ambrose's uh, teaching there. Second um, thing I wanted to talk about today was church prayers. So we've had church history, church, uh, church fathers, sorry, now we've got church prayers. Um, we all know cafes, confession, um, alms giving, fasting, Eucharist, scriptures, saints, all undergirded with prayer. Prayer is the thing that holds everything together. When this woman touched Jesus' garments, it was a prayer, really. God, help me. Heal me. And she had faith, and he healed her. The power went out from him, and he felt it go from him. Amazing story. Amazing story. And, um, and then the little girl, you know, she died. Jairus came to him. That was a prayer. God, help me. Help me. My daughter's dying. And he went, and he raised her from the dead. Amazing. So when we're praying, we're touching Jesus. We're coming to him. God, help me. God, do something for my friends or my family. And we do that through the liturgy. Come to the liturgy every Sunday. It's called a Eucharist. So its prime purpose is, is from the Greek, Eucharisto. thank you. Thank you, Lord, for all that you've done for us. You came into this world. You suffered on, you, you, you lived among us, you taught us how to live, you suffered on the cross, you rose from the dead, you ascended into heaven, and uh, you sent your Holy Spirit to be with us. So we're here today to thank God. But there is part of the services which are actually petitions, where we're asking God for certain things. And uh, a question came up uh, at the um, uh, annual general meeting this year, and it said this, and I want to deal with this. Can you explain the process for prayer for the living and the dead throughout, through the liturgy? Often it seems that we are praying for the same people each week. When I have submitted prayer requests, they have not been included. And I presume whoever wrote that meant included in the great entrance prayers. So I want to, I want to address this at the moment. Just like Jesus touched um, the garment, sorry, the, the woman with the flow of blood touched the garment of Jesus, um, well, when we come to church, we can touch things too. We can touch the icons and receive a blessing. We can touch um, uh, the... Um, what's the other thing I was going to say there? The, or we can light candles, that's right. And on this particular day, we're reminded of why... You probably Some of you who are new to the church are wondering why everybody's going to the end of the pews so that when the priests go past, they touch their garment. Have you noticed that? And, uh, and that's based on this story. 
This is where it comes from. The tradition comes from. So he touched, because you see on the back of his, it's not a picture of me on the back here. It's a picture of Christ. <laughs> so the priest standing between the, uh, the first coming of Christ and the second coming of Christ is representing the people. The, the, the icon on the left is, is Mary, but it's actually Jesus at his first coming in the arms of Mary. And on the right is the second coming of Christ. So the priest stands in the middle there representing the people. When, you, when we go around, Father Nicholas and I, people come out and they touch our garments. And the, the idea there is not just to, um, to touch them, uh, to wear them out, but to say a prayer. Send a prayer up to the altar. All right, and it might be a prayer for yourself. Oh God, help me, heal me. Or it might be a prayer for somebody else. Please help so-and-so. And that goes up with me to the altar. I don't know what it is, but God knows. And he answers. <clears throat> also, um, then when we come to um, the great entrance and so on, there are, there are different ways that we pray for people in the uh, church. Before the church, Father Nicholas has, <clears throat> or myself if I'm doing the proscomedi prayers, long lists of people. And the way you get on those lists is you go onto the, web, the weekly email and you click the link which um, you can put the name of the person you want prayed for into that list. And Father Nicholas takes that every week and we pray for those people before the service starts. So they get prayed there. If you want, to, if you want your, uh, somebody prayed for in the great entrance, then <clears throat> you either have to contact me or Father Nicholas uh, and say, we'd like this for the great entrance, please. Now, in the, other, in the other Orthodox churches, the tradition is you actually give a donation if you want something um, prayed for in the great entrance. That is the, the Orthodox tradition. We haven't pushed that <clears throat> because we don't want people to get the idea that uh, we, we're asking for money to pray. Do you see what I mean? It's the wrong, it's the wrong thing to be saying. We need your money if you're going to pray. If we're going to pray for you, that's not what the whole idea is. So we're not demanding that. But it's a kind of um, giving a donation is an expression of thanksgiving. So you you give a donation as an expression of thanksgiving that God is going to hear my prayer. So does that make sense? But if you want something in the in the great entrance prayers, you need to say. This is for the great entrance prayers. Otherwise, it goes into the other prayers which Father uh, Nicholas prays at the beginning. And when we, when we mention somebody's names, uh, like uh, in the great entrance prayers, all the names that he has, he puts a particle of bread from the, um, the lamb, the, from, from the bread that we have to take the lamb from, and he puts a particle for every name onto the thing that we carry around, the, the, the plate which comes into the altar. And at the end, all those particles go into what remains of the blood of Christ. So everybody is washed in the blood of Christ, all those names that you give us. There's a marvelous symbolism there, and there's a prayer for them. It's just powerful symbolism. All right, so I hope, hope that um, is, is clear now, how you do it. The proscomedia is getting longer and longer as the church gets bigger and bigger, um, some, well, one of the questions here was, why is it the same people every week? Mainly, we don't, we don't just put, uh, can you pray for Tom, Dick, and Harry because I don't want you to pray for them. They're, they're there for a reason. So I heard this morning, actually, we've been praying for somebody who had cancer. And I've heard this morning that she's been healed through her treatment and everything. So we keep them there until they get better. We had somebody in Western Australia, would you believe, who is in a coma. He's come out of his coma. So we keep praying for them until, they, until God answers the prayer somehow. That's why they're there every week. And there's all sorts of different things there. Um, and there's people, when people die, we, we keep them there for 40 days, um, uh, and so on and so on. So that's, that's how we do it. And uh, the, the Russians have a different method. The Russians don't do what we do. In, Pray for the names just as you go in. They, every person, and we've thought about this, we might do it. Every person has a book. And they have the names of all their loved ones in the book. And the book is given out 
to the, given to the priest before the service, and he reads all those names at the same thing. And then they don't do it during the great entrance prayers. Um, so that's, that's sort of being thought about. We'll see. But this is the Antiochian way. All right, so I hope that answers the question that came to us. It was a good question and needed to be answered. And then the third point, third and last point, is church encouragement. Um, so we've had church fathers, church prayers, now church encouragement. And I, I want to encourage you about what happens when our prayers aren't answered or they seem not to be answered. Um, <clears throat> this week, um, on Monday, the church that we wanted, which is just around two corners, which we, we wanted to buy, and the Anglicans said, we're going to put a special mission consideration on this building. And uh, I thought, wow, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. This is wonderful. But they didn't finish the sentence because the rest of the sentence said, as long as you can give us millions of dollars right now because we're desperate. And we couldn't. So on Monday this week, a sign went up in front of the church saying, for sale. And they're looking at millions of dollars, unfortunately. And uh, so I, I was kind of trying to encourage myself, you know, there's no such thing as disappointment. Did you know that? There's only his appointment. But it's, it's still disappointing, <laughs> if you know what I mean. Anyway, I, my, my psalms that day gave me incredible encouragement. And I want to share um, this with you because I think it'll encourage us all. I'm using a new, a different version of the, of the psalms that I've never used before. It's a, it's a psalms that I, it's a Fontana book. I, book, book, I got it in a second-hand bookshop. And, um, and it's, but I, I've stumbled on something amazing because it's a special translation where they've taken into consideration the latest understanding of the scriptures and so on, but particularly they've taken into consideration the poetic rhythm of the Psalms. Did you know they were poetry? This is poetry. It, when you translate it word for word and so on, you just read it, it doesn't, it doesn't sound like poetry to us in the West. It doesn't rhyme, but it is poetry. And there's a, there's a rhythm to it, which is missed by many people. And the French were the first to sort this one out about halfway through the last century. And then they, they set about, they set about um, doing the same thing in English. And this is what this book is all about. And uh, this is what I've stumbled on. And uh, it's, it changes the meaning. You, you, you know, you're not what you think you are. But what you think, you are. See what I'm saying there? The same words, <laughs> slightly different arrangement. I'm going to read you Psalm 90 in the Septuagint, or Psalm 91 in the Western Bibles. First of all, in the Orthodox Study Bible, three lines. He, sh he shall call upon me, and I will hear him. I am with him, second line, I am with him in affliction, third line, and I will deliver and glorify him. Three lines. The English Standard Version, which is the Western Bible, when he calls to me, I will answer him. First line. Second line, I will be with him in trouble. Third line, I will rescue him and honour him. Wonderful stuff. Yep. Three lines each, slightly different, slightly different, but basically the same meaning. But what neither of these have attempted to do is to trans in the translation is to take into account the rhythmic structure of the poetry of the Psalms. And it makes an unbelievable difference. <clears throat> Let me now read to you uh, what it, when you get the rhythm, rhythmic uh, uh, origin of the Psalms, how it reads. When he calls, I shall answer, I am with you. I will save him in distress and give him glory. Let, 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 just let this sink in. When he calls, I shall answer, I am with you. That's how, it, that's how it goes in the psalm. When he calls, I shall answer, I am with you. We called, we asked God to help us with this church, and he answered, I am with you. 
Wow. Whew. Completely lifted my soul this week. We, have, we failed getting that church, but God is saying, I am with you. This is the promise that Jesus gave before he sent him into heaven at the end of his time on earth. I am with you to the end of the age. And when we pray, sometimes he answers. Sometimes we get an incredible blessing. Like the, the person who's healed from cancer. Wonderful. Thank God for that. Sometimes we don't get these sorts of answers. And we might say, and some people say, I don't believe in God anymore. He doesn't answer my prayers. But he does. They say there's three ways you can get an answer. It could be yes, it could be no, it could be wait. But I'm saying now it's something else. When he calls, I shall answer, I am with you. So God is with us. So if you ever get disappointed about a non-answered prayer, it's not a non-answered prayer. He's saying, I am with you. And do you know what? I'd rather have that than a church building. <laughs> I'd rather not have the church building and not have God with me. I'd rather have God with me. So thanks be to God for that. So when we think, um, uh, we pray for someone, they're not healed, what's God's answer? I am with you. We pray to pass our exams and we fail. What's God saying? I am with you. We pray for God's help in a difficult situation. He doesn't act immediately. What's God's answer? I am with you. We pray for a property and we can't find a suitable one. What is God's answer? I am with you. What more do we need to hear from God than that? You remember, I'm going to finish this with a story of uh, um, footprints in the sand. Have you heard that one? Great story. Anybody not heard it? I'll share it anyway because it's a great story. Somebody went through a very difficult time in their lives and um, they really felt that God had deserted them. And um, in their dream, they, they looked back and they could see two sets of footsteps for a while. And then, then for a while, there was only one, foot step, one, one set of footsteps in the sand. And they said to Jesus when they saw him, but that's the time when I was having the worst time in my life. Why did you desert me at that stage of my life? And Jesus said, there's only one set of footprints because I was carrying you. <laughs> when we call, I will, when he calls, I will answer, I am with you. I am with you. Sometimes I'm carrying you, but I'm with you. Thanks be to God for his great love for us and for the world which we are here to share his good news with. Now to God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, be ascribed all might, majesty, dominion and praise, now and forever and to the ages of ages. Amen.